Sabielitich, and I'm so excited to be here talking with you again. I wish I were there in person. It's always so nice to be able to meet people and to see your faces. And you know, if I say something awful and a cloud comes over your face, that helps to alert me, but uh, I'm flying blind. But at any rate, I'm Elisa Bielitich. I was here last week with you as well, and I'll be here again, God willing, next week. Um, let's open with a short prayer. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen. Holy Lord, we thank you for bringing us together today, and we ask that you enlighten our minds and hearts, that we, that we may perceive you in one another, and that we may be of blessing and benefit to one another. Let your Holy Spirit be present with us now and always. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen. Good morning. Uh, so we spoke last week, we got started on our series, Creating an Orthodox Home. And last week we were talking about some of the mechanics of what an Orthodox rhythm in your home would look like, right? What is the schedule and what is a more standard American schedule might be kind of a hectic schedule, a little bit crazy, it tears us apart, but the church offers us a rhythm of prayer cycles, of fasting, of church services that, um, that replenish us, that nourish us. So if we can live by those cycles, we have a better life. We have, you know. So today though, we talked, I guess before, more about mechanics. And today we wanna move into this problem that sometimes, especially we Orthodox, because we have so many rituals and we have so many beautiful prayers and, and fasting and we have all these wonderful things that we can do that are physical because God is wise and he knows us, he created us. So he gave us physical things because he knows that we're body and soul. Sometimes we can just be going through the motions. And this can be a double concern, I think for parents, um, just all of us need to worry about whether we're going through the motions or whether we're really making an offering to Christ with every prayer, with every time we fast, every time we give alms, all of that always has to be with Christ in mind. And then as parents, how do we do, how do we pass that on to our kids? How do we help our kids not just show up? I mean, we can yell at the kids and say, look, you're gonna lose your phone if you don't come to church, something like that. We can force them, but we can only force the physical part, right? We can't force the spiritual part. And there's also a question of when is it good to tell the kids that they have to go to church? When is it better to step back? It's all, it's all a difficult balance. So a lot of times we talk about parenting teens as if they were a totally different kind of animal. There's something else entirely, but the truth is, these same problems that they might have, um, you know, just kind of maybe rebelling against church or not understanding or not having a relationship with Christ yet. These are all situations that we find ourselves in just as often. This is something that impacts all of us. And indeed, you know, it's interesting. There's a, there's a saint from Greece named Saint Porphyrios who passed away recently. He was one of my, well, 1991 feels very recent to me. It's like 30 years ago. Um, he said some very beautiful things about parenting, which I find very inspiring and very helpful. And one of the things he said essentially is, if you wanna raise a saint, you have to become a saint. So it's really literally true that being able to parent real Christians who truly love Christ is something that's only gonna come if we are real Christians who truly love Christ. So the two questions go hand in hand, our own spirituality, and if we're parents, the spirituality of our children. St. Porfirio said something, as I said, very beautiful. When children grow up in an atmosphere of freedom, and at the same time are surrounded by the good example of grown-ups, they are a joy to see. The secret is to be good and saintly, and to inspire and radiate. The life of the children seems to be affected by the radiation of their parents. If the parents insist, come on now, go and make confession, go and receive communion, and so on, nothing is achieved. But what does your child see in you? How do you live and what do you radiate? Does Christ radiate in you? That is what is transmitted to your child. This is where the secret lies. And this is in the book, Wounded by Love. St. Porfirios. I think this is such beautiful advice and also terrifying advice, <laughs> quite frankly, because do you radiate Christ? 
can you be filled up enough with Christ that you can radiate his love? Can you radiate it to your children? Right? Like this is a challenge. This is a tremendous challenge. And it's a very beautiful thing. And uh, so, you know, we can take the children to church and we need to, they need to have the opportunity to worship and to pray. They need to learn these traditions. They need to pray with us in the home and bless their food and learn to fast, to do all these things. But we can only help them with the physical. And the thing is, if we're doing it and we don't mean it, if we're just going through the motions, our kids are hypocrisy detectors. They see it instantly. And they think about that. And it tells them that this is empty ritual. And now in past generations, well, certainly, you know, if you live in a different culture that's a more orthodox culture, there's more of a peer pressure to stay Christian, um, to stay orthodox and to do the orthodox things, or at least it's, it's supported in the culture. In our culture, it's not supported. We don't live in an orthodox culture. And so we have this double problem that if we're showing them some kind of hollow, empty ritual, and then they're also being pressured by this culture to look at Christianity and, and think of it as something that's empty. You know, I don't know why they would stay Christian, quite frankly. So we have to radiate Christ. It's not just that we want our kids to stay in the church, and we do. We do. We talk about it. How will we keep the kids in the church, right? But it's actually got to be that, we, that they want to be in the church. And we need to think about it that way. It's not like, oh, well, what we need to do is just build bigger fences around our churches and then they can't get out. We're not trying to trap them. It's that we really want them to love the church. So we have to think about how we cultivate that and how we radiate that love. So there's a study released by the Pew Center. Uh, I think it's back in 2012. So it's a little bit out of date. Um, and unfortunately, my guess is that the numbers might have gotten worse since then and not better, but it was interesting. Uh, they found that there used to be uh, like 10 years before, this country was 78.4% Christian. Uh, that is not necessarily people going to church every week and really, but you can't, can't do a poll that tells you who truly loves Christ, right? But you can do a poll that says, how do you identify religiously? And it used to be that 78.4% of Americans said that they were Christian. And then by 2012, it dropped to 70%. And presumably it continues to drop. Now, the interesting numbers are really for the Orthodox, right? Because that's, that's where, we, where our interest lies. Among the Orthodox, of people who were raised identifying Orthodox, so cradle Orthodox people, 53% stay and continue to consider themselves Orthodox as adults. 47% do not. So about half, half of the Orthodox people in America will grow up in the church and say, no, I'm not Orthodox anymore. And among those who still identify as Orthodox, I think we all have in our own personal experience, we know people who identify as Orthodox, but who don't embrace the faith in a way that's really transformative and life-changing for them, right? Or life-giving, that it's just kind of a, it's a thing I do, I'm Orthodox, I'm tall and whatever. So the church is losing half of its youth. And this would suggest that somehow we're not doing a good job. There's something we're missing. There's something we're not doing right. And I think part of it is that in past generations, tradition for tradition's sake made a lot more sense to people. And I think that in these generations coming up, that doesn't make sense anymore. And so we have to find some other ways to reach people. And I'm not, I'm not saying that the tradition for tradition's sake was ever a great way to do it either. I think St. Porfidios is right. I think that what we want is for them to have a fire in their hearts. And so first we develop our fire and then we radiate it toward them. Now, there is a really wonderful study by the Barna Group, uh, which was saying, you know, among people who do stay in the faith of their childhood, what is it that made them stay? And it, there are a whole bunch of different factors. And I think as parents, we worry that their friends are the most important factor. And their friends are really important to them. But in terms of their faith, things that really helped were um, children who had the opportunity to worship. So actually going to church, actually praying in the home. People who had role models of the same faith. So that would be like godparents. When you go to church, are you involved in the community? Are there adults and maybe older kids, whatever, college students, 
who interact with your child and are role models of people for whom the faith is really important and for whom the faith is, is meaningful. The last one, and really actually I think in order of importance from the Barna study, this is one of the highest things that made the biggest difference for kids. If kids saw that their parents' lives were positively impacted by the faith, if they saw that their parents were fed by their faith, that inspired them to stay in the church, which of course is what St. Porfirios is saying, right? Do you radiate Christ? If you do, your children are going to pick that up. And I think it's interesting, again, you know, it's not if your parents went to church every week. It's not, did your parents make you fast? Did your parents tell you to wear a cross, whatever? It's, did your parents' lives, were, were, they, were they profoundly affected by the faith? Does the faith give your parents life? So one of the things, you know, this is kind of a twofold thing. We have to have that faith and that fire in us. We also have to communicate that to our children. So we're gonna talk a little bit about both of those things. Um, you know, it's interesting. I wonder, first of all, why we've been doing things wrong, right? Like what is the mistake we're making that would cause so many people to lose the church or to leave the church? And if we can identify that, maybe we can change it, right? And I, you know, there's not one particular thing. One of the things that I hear a lot of when I talk to young adults who have left the church or, or who maybe many of them still believe and they still believe in the truth of the Orthodox church, but they're just not attending right now. And a lot of that has to do with connection and relationship to people. And so again, you know, just like what your parents do, what your kids, what your friends think, all of these things really matter in the decision-making of our young people. And so we need to be aware of them. And I think one of the things uh, also that we parents do wrong is I think we operate out of fear quite a bit. I think this culture is very hostile to Christianity. We can see that a lot of people leave the church. We're worried about it. We're worried about keeping our kids on the straight and narrow, right? We don't want the kids using drugs. We don't want them going off and, and ruining their lives. So we operate with a lot of fear. And I think, you know, when fear is doing the driving, we're going to be in, we're going to be in trouble. We're going to end up on the wrong path because fear is not a good driver. Acting out of fear is not good. Think about St. Peter on the water, right? Um, we read in Matthew chapter 14, and Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. So he said, come. And when Peter had come down out of the boat, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw that the wind was boisterous, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched out his hand and caught him and said to him, oh, you have little faith. Why did you doubt? And they got into the boat and the wind, ce the wind ceased. When Peter had no fear in him, he could walk on water. When he was bold and just filled with faith, you know, Lord, help me to do this. He just did it, right? We're given this big task of trying to, trying to radiate Christ, that's intimidating. It's big. But if we can do it without fear, and if we can do it with faith like Peter did, we can walk on water, right? But then when we see that the wind is boisterous, when we see this culture around us and we feel the temptations and we feel just that, that impact that it's having on us, we get scared. And that's when we falter. But like Peter, when we falter, we need to say, Lord, save me right? It's not that Peter faltered and drowned and <laughs> was finished, but it's that Peter faltered, he was scared, and so he reached out in prayer to Christ, and Christ lifted him up, and that's what we need to do. When we are feeling afraid of what's going to happen with this culture, what's going to happen with our children, what's going to happen even with ourselves, frankly, what's going to happen with our nation, all of these things, we really need to reach out in prayer and to trust in God and to think about uh, what really matters, right? To have our eyes on the kingdom, to have our eyes on Christ and not to be so much focused on the world. And of course, it's hard to say, you know, oh, don't be afraid, don't have any fear. You know, this is, this is nerve wracking. There's so much change in our culture right now. There's so much shifting in our culture. And um, 
I think that it makes us anxious. I think that it makes us nervous. I think that, and I think it's not just us. I think it's our kids. I think people outside the church are nervous. I think that all of us can feel this instability. And so we worry and we don't know exactly what's coming next. So we have to keep our eyes on Christ because that instability and that anxiety, that's just fear and it carries us to the wrong place. And like Peter, we need to be watching Christ. Now keep in mind that the central event of Christianity, the incarnation and resurrection of Jesus Christ happens during the Roman Empire, right? Right in there in the Roman Empire, you know, a, a society full of pagans, you know, idol worship, all sorts of cruelty and depravity. You know, it's not that Christ can only come to the holiest city or to the holiest culture. Christ comes to all of us and he comes in times of turmoil and he comes when the, when the culture around you is not healthy, is not supportive, is not good. And in fact, you know, we all know the church has flourished during times of oppression, during times of persecution. Um, Christ tells us in John chapter 15, and I, I have a problem reading from this chapter because it's one of the most beautiful things and I just want to read the whole thing and I will control myself and we'll just stick, our, stick to a small part of it. Uh, but Christ has just been telling them, love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, than to lay down one's life for, one's, for his friends. And he talks about how we're not his servants, we're his friends, you know, that he, that he loves us. And he says, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should remain, that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give you. These things I command you that you love one another. If the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. Yet because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will keep yours also. But all these things they will do to you for my name's sake, because they do not know him who sent me. Right? So what are we supposed to expect the world to be like? You know, Christ didn't say, your nation will always be Christian and it'll always be good and it'll always be doing exactly the things that I prescribed for it, right? He warned us that the world is against him. The world is, is not following Christ. The world doesn't know him who sent me, right? The world doesn't know God. There are those of us who do and who follow Christ and then there's, there are those who don't. And we'll always, we'll always be living among some who don't. So it's not necessary to be in a Christian culture. But what is necessary? What's necessary for a Christian today? What was necessary for a Christian back then? What's necessary for an adult Christian, for a teen Christian? It's, it's all about our hearts, right? It's about our hearts. St. Theophane the Recluse says, if there is prayer, the soul lives. Without prayer, there is no spiritual life. And you know, we've heard Christ say to uh, some of his disciples when he was calling them, let the dead bury the dead, right? There's a sense that the people in the world have a deadness about them, a spiritual death, a spiritual deadness. And we have to awaken that life. Christ awakens that life. The Holy Spirit awakens that life in us. But without prayer, there is no spiritual life. Prayer helps the soul to live. So that's where we need to be putting our attention. And that doesn't just mean reading prayer books. It, it does mean reading prayer books. It means you know, praying spontaneously, praying from prayer books. But if we want to radiate Christ, we need Christ to live inside of us. That needs to be a whole different kind of prayer. That cannot be going through the motions. And uh, keep in mind, not only do we need to have Christ inside us and then radiate it, we also need to be able to communicate it with our children. So this is a lot. But I think one of the key things is for us to really mean our prayers and to be able to talk with one another about it, to be able to be vulnerable, vulnerable about it. And one of the, you know, that would mean talking about our experiences with God, right? If you're talking to someone, one of your children or godchildren or someone perhaps in the church who's talking about 
going through a dry time, going through a time when they just don't feel God's presence. We've all been through dry times. We don't want to pretend that we've never been there, that we're fine, everything's fine over here. What's better is to open up and to talk about it with them, right? So to be able to say to our children, yeah, I've, I've been there, I've gone through that, and this is what helped me. Or, you know, here's a book about it. Let's read it together. Let's figure it out. Let's go talk to Abuna and ask him about that together, right? To role model for them that you're still learning, that you're still struggling, that the spiritual life is not magic, right? Because they may think, well, I'm just not, one of my girls actually said this to me recently. She's 10 and uh, she's a sweetheart, but she's going through this phase where everything is very concrete. And she's like, you know, I think I'm just not a prayer person. I say the prayers, but I don't feel God. I think I'm just not built for it. And I was like, you know, nobody's built for it exactly. This is something that happens. This, this is a transformation that we work for. So we're going to need to communicate to our kids, not just what to do, but why we do it. Why do we pray? Why do we fast? Why do we follow all these rules? We have all these guidelines. We have all these rituals. We have all these things in the church. What is the point of them? We need to know that answer and we need to be able to communicate it to them. And I'll say, let, let's talk about fasting because that's a good one uh, in the sense that there are a lot of rules to follow and it's not always clear to people why we're doing it. Um, St. John Climacus said, control your appetites before they control you. And that is why we fast. And that is a big part of what we focus on with the kids, right? This gives you self-discipline. This is how you practice saying no to food so that you can then say no to other passions. Well, that's true, but there's something else really important about fasting that I feel like we don't talk about enough. And that is the fact that fasting is an aid to prayer. Fasting helps us to grow closer to God. It's a, it's a means to salvation. Uh, Saint Seraphim of Sarov said, one should not think about the doings of God when one's stomach is full. On a full stomach, there can be no vision of the divine mysteries. So, you know, I, and that's really interesting. I don't think American Christians think about this as being the case. And we Orthodox, this is part of our teaching, but we don't always, we're not always aware of it or thinking about it. Um, and try to picture something like Thanksgiving, some kind of feast, um, some, you know, Christmas, whatever. You've just had a huge, wonderful meal with your family, rich foods. What does everyone do on Thanksgiving after the meal? They go take a nap, right? People go nap on the couch. They watch a football game. They relax. They can't move around, right? There's this idea that like when, when we fill up like that, when we're satiated, then we need to sleep. We need to rest. We're not sharp. But when we're hungry, we're sharp. And so that's the logic of the fast, really, is to not ever be so satiated that you can't pray well. And the more we fast as we get further into it, in part because that hunger helps prayer, our prayers are better, right? They're more transformative, they're more effective. Uh, I think it's also that by making the offering of the fasting, I think God sees that and he rewards that. He sees our intentions, he sees our efforts, and he cares about them. So fasting has like a, a there's an actual physical reality in our bodies that impacts our prayer life. And so it makes sense that we would fast. If you explain it that way to your kids, um, that makes sense to them because it's logical, right? And that's helpful because then they see, oh, maybe it's not so empty. And then if you can have a conversation that says, you know, one year for Lent, I did a really bad job of fasting. And when I came to Pascha, it was different. Um, and then there's another year where I, where I fasted and I prayed and I really made an effort and I was able to focus. And that Pascha was more powerful for me. That transformed me. That taught me some things. I grew closer to God. If we can be vulnerable and talk about those things with our kids, then they're going to see how this is happening inside of us and they're going to understand it and it's going to be meaningful to them. Now, you know, what about prayer? Why do we pray? Why do we want to pray? Why do we want to fast so that we can pray better, right? What's the purpose of prayer? Now, prayer, of course, is just to get closer to God, right? Claire, uh, prayer brings us closer to God. It makes us know God more. We stand in his presence. Um, there's a great quote from St. Theophane the Recluse. 
But I repeat, remember, all of this is a guide. The heart of the matter is, stand with reverence before God, with the mind and the heart, and strive toward him with longing. So real prayer is to feel God's presence or to try to feel God's presence, to be still and try to reach out to God's presence and be aware of it and to be known by him, to strive toward him with longing, right? To want to know God. Now, there's a lovely, right? There's a lovely idea in Ezekiel, okay? In the, in the book of Ezekiel, God is talking to his prophet and he says of Israel in Ezekiel 36, 26, I shall give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I shall take the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I love this idea that Israel had a heart of stone, it was a hard heart and a cold heart that had turned away from God, right? When they were stiff necked, they wouldn't bow down. And God will replace that with a heart of flesh, with a heart that is soft, a heart that beats, a heart that gives life. And that soft heart feels God's presence. So the more time that we spend in prayer, the time that we spend in services, the time that we spend in fasting, the effort that we put in, all of these things are softening our hearts because God wants us to have soft hearts. And I think if we can think about it in really simple terms like that, I think it's helpful to our spiritual lives, but I think it's also really helpful for our children uh, because you can say, you know, okay, prayer is talking to God. Well, you know, God doesn't talk back. So that's weird. And just sort of standing there in front of an icon reading words is weird. But if you can think about it as something that's really going to have an effect on you, that it's going to change you, then it becomes more clear why God would want us to do it all the time. And that's really the interesting thing about all of the, you know, the rules in the church. I don't know if I would call them rules. They're kind of guidelines, right? But they're, they're rules, they're guidelines, whatever they are. They're just kind of natural law. They're just it's not that God is making up a bunch of rules for us. It's that these are the things that work. These are the things that give you life, right? God says, pray. Not because, you know, he's some egomaniac who wants you bowing down to him, but because it's good for you, because it softens your heart. God says to fast, it's good for you. It softens your heart, right? All of the rules that God gives are really about how to live in love with one another and how to live in such a way that our heart can be transformed by God and that we can be ever more feeling his presence. So if we can explain it that way to our kids and frankly, to other people as well, you know, people, our culture not being Orthodox, um, even the people who are Christian in our culture, a lot of them are Christians in a way that has a lot less a lot less ritual, a lot less activity, right? They don't fast on Wednesdays and Fridays. They don't have as many services as we have. They don't pray the same prayers that we do. Um, so they don't understand it. But if we can explain that these are practices that are designed to help our souls, to bring life to our souls and to bring us closer to God, that makes sense. And it's true. <laughs> and, it's, and it's not, you know, we can't, radiate Christ when we're just communicating this like well there are a bunch of rules and you have to follow them or else um, we need to be thinking about the real meaning behind all of these rules and that is to love Christ now here's the thing though what if you don't love Christ like what if you don't like to strive toward him with longing right um, some of my kids don't always feel like they long for Christ they, you know like my daughter said I'm just not I'm not a natural prayer person, right? I don't yearn to be with Christ. I yearn to play video games. We can actually ask for that desire. We can pray for it. We can pray for all sorts. We can pray for compunction before confession. We can pray to know what our confession should be. We can pray, Lord, make me love you more. Make me want to love you more. You know, Lord, give me a love for your services. Give me a love for prayer. We can pray that for the people around us who need it, our children, our godchildren. When we see a friend of ours is struggling with this, pray, ask for it. You can send your guardian angel to go talk to their guardian angel. I, I, it sounds crazy, right? But it, when you start reading the lives of the saints, the kinds of things they do are really remarkable. 
And what it is, is it's behaving with a real belief that the kingdom of God is real, that being present in the kingdom matters, that there are saints and angels who are here to help us. And we're going to take them up on that help. We're going to say to the saints and the angels, you know, help my kid, help my godchild, help my friend, help me, give me that love for Christ so that I can radiate Christ. If we ask for it, he will give it to us. But we don't often think to ask for it, which is funny, right? We ask for things, we ask for experiences, maybe. We don't always ask for longing. We think that that's something that comes from within us. Maybe sometimes it does, but maybe it comes from the Holy Spirit. And maybe that's even more precious when it does. Uh, Elder Thaddeus of Vitovnica, which is a, he's a Serbian saint, he said, it is of great significance if there's a person who truly prays in a family. Prayer attracts God's grace and all the members of the family feel it, even those whose hearts have grown cold. Pray always. So even if you're the only one praying, it still matters. Right, And as you pass this along and as they see you begin to fill with Christ and to radiate Christ, this inspires them. And this is true for people, um, you know, sometimes you're married and you're kind of unequally yoked in a spiritual way where one person is very deeply spiritual and one person is not, you know, pray, just pray for each other, pray for your spouse that, that these things get deeper, ask for it. Don't forget to ask God for it. So we, I think we all feel like we're working upstream in this culture because this culture is so different from orthodoxy. But again, remember, you know, Christ did not come to a friendly culture and he did not promise a friendly culture. In fact, he told us the world's going to hate you. It's going to be hard. And don't, you know, don't be afraid. So I think, though, you know, that this culture is very anxious. I think as things are shifting around all the time, people are, they say record amounts of anxiety in our children, record amounts of anxiety in our parents. Uh, there are people uh, in the universities, the professors in universities talk about how these days uh, kids like can't emotionally handle tests coming up. And that they also notice that those same kids, the parents are trying to call the professors to talk to them about the kids work. When the parent, hovers and acts anxious about the child, it makes the child feel like the parent has no faith in them and it makes the child anxious, right? We have all of these sort of vicious circles going on in our culture where we're all getting very anxious. But when we interact with this culture, I think it's really important, first of all, to remember that we are impacted by the culture. We're a part of it. Sometimes we orthodox, it'll be like, oh, you know, there's us and then there's the Americans. And it's like, well, you know, you're here, you're an American, right? You're impacted by it. All of these ways of thinking, all of these like weird habits, all of these things that are American are in us. And so we need to recognize it and be humble about it. Now, we need to be loving, right? Christ says, love one another as I have loved you and the world is gonna hate you. And he says, pray for your enemies, right? We have to encounter this world in a way that we're praying for our enemies, that we're praying for the world. I think that when we come, when we raise, when we talk to our kids or when we think ourselves about the schoolyard, the workplace, wherever it is that we're going and finding some kind of hostility to Christianity, we need to be thinking of it not so much in a condemning way, like, oh, they're doing it wrong. Perhaps they are. But we need to be thinking of it in a prayerful and loving way, like, I wish that they had Christ. I wish that this love were radiating inside of them so that all of these things would get better, right? So it has to be coming from a prayerful place, from a loving place. And that's actually really important raising teenagers because teenagers are going to developmentally go through this time where they have to, it's just necessary. They pull away from the family and they go out into the world. And they start to identify with the world a bit, right? So if you've presented it like us versus them, and then developmentally they hit this part where they have to go be them and separate from us, well, you know, you're almost sending them out of the church, right? But if you can express to them that wanting 
these things for, for the culture around us is just wanting them to have Christ, is wanting them to have love. You know, if we're wanting the culture to stop doing things that are sinful, it's not that they're breaking the rules, it's that they're separating themselves from love, from God. And that because of that, it shows that we, we love everyone, we love the world, even when the world is doing the wrong thing. And that I think helps our kids because they may love the world too. And it's helpful for them to be thinking of it in a way that like, what would be better for the world? What would be good for the world? And so I think, you know, we just need to really focus on the idea that we need to operate out of love and not out of fear. Too much of our activities out of fear. And we really need to be thinking about what can be loving. And we'll talk more about it um, next week as well. I, I do, you know, when you think about how you're gonna interact in the workplace, how you're gonna interact on the schoolyard. Uh, think about Mahatma Gandhi, right? Gandhi, not a Christian, said, I like your Christ, I do not like your Christians. Your Christians are so unlike your Christ, right? That's, that's part of our problem in this culture, right? Why is our culture moving away from Christ? Maybe because the Christians weren't impressive enough. Maybe we weren't loving enough. Maybe we weren't radiating Christ. And so maybe they've wandered off, right? But what we need in this country and in this whole world is more love of Christ, right? So if we can radiate it, that can transform our little corner, our little corner of the world, our little corner of America. And we do what we can, right? We're not here to save the world. We're here to work on our souls, to work on the souls of our children and our godchildren, those around us. And, uh, and we're here, I think truly, to uh, be agents of Christ's love. And if we can think of that, you know, maybe people will be more inspired by us. But uh, at any rate, so that I, I wanna open up to questions. I wanna see, uh, oh, there's a link here. I'm gonna link to the document here. You can share questions on the Google document. Um, you know what I have? I have the form where you can send the question, but I don't have the responses yet. So I will need the responses before I can look it up. So I don't know what your questions are, but uh, I hope that for the most part that made sense. I'm going to wait on a place for the questions. I guess I can look to at the YouTube page. If you wanted to post them on the YouTube page, I can look there. Unfortunately, I can't see the Google document yet. But um, I don't know, do I just keep talking? I hate to do that. I want to I wanna hear from you. I want to hear back from you. But uh, I think we have all of this anxiety about our kids and about this culture. We worry about what's happening to our country. We worry about what's happening to our kids, to our friends, to the people around us. And I think that uh, it's really important, especially when thinking about our kids, to remember that in our lifetime, we have gone through difficult times. And very often it's that suffering, it's that difficulty. We talked about this a little bit last week. The suffering and the struggle is very much where we come to know Christ. It's, it's the arena in which we grow closer to God, we wrestle with God. And so it's important for people to have the opportunity to wrestle with God. And that includes our kids. So I think sometimes as parents, you know, I, I'm a parent, my kids run from 21 to 10. I have five girls. I'm really learning with the 21-year-old and the 19-year-old as they go out into the world, right? They do scary things. They have scary ideas and you're just thinking like, oh boy, how's this going to work out? Keep in mind that we really do have to go through some things before we mature spiritually. Not everyone. Some kids sort of have that light in them and it just works out. Some of us fight more with God, you know? Some of us battle more with him just because of our nature. And if that's what your kids are doing, keep in mind that that, that struggle can really lead to a deeper faith and a better faith. It doesn't, it's not the end of the story necessarily, right? And we just keep praying. We pray to give them strength. We pray for inspiration to them. And we sit back and when they're at home, we're radiating Christ right? Not radiating anxiety and anger and fear and, you know, sometimes we're going to get mad. 
that's natural, it's good sometimes, but, but to really, generally speaking, to be able to radiate Christ, to be filled up with Christ ourselves, and to be able to spread that to our children, I think, I think that's what we give them, that's what we do for them, and ultimately it's up to them to figure out how to work it out, and it's got to be their offering, prayer has to be their offering, fasting has to be their offering, following all the the guidelines or the rules or doing all these things that make the physical things, the motions that make an Orthodox life, it's got to be an offering. So it's sort of, it's a process raising kids, right? When they're young, you tell them to go to church and you tell them to stand up and pray. And, you, and as they get older, you have to help them come to a point where they're going to offer it themselves, where they want to do it. And that might mean that every once in a while, they don't do it. You know, I, I was really surprised. I had one daughter who um, one year just said she wasn't going to fast. She didn't want to fast for Lent. And I said, okay, all right, you're 14. Don't fast for Lent. See how that goes. And she didn't. The rest of us did. She didn't. And when Pascha came, she told me that it felt empty, that Pascha had always been her favorite thing. It had been so meaningful to her. And that by not preparing her soul, she didn't feel it. Like it was there, but it just, she didn't feel it. And so she learned something. And after that, she fasts. But she fasts because she wants to and because she knows there's a benefit to it, because she trusts God to, you know, transform her through it. So that's where we want the kids to get. And it might mean that for a little while, they're not going to do it. It might mean that they walk away in order to appreciate it. That happens with a lot of people. It might've happened with you. Um, and another, you know, I, I wasn't raised in the Orthodox church. I came in over 20 years ago. Um, I left the faith of my parents, right? They gave me a love for Christ. They gave me a desire for the kingdom. Uh, but they didn't have any of the things that orthodoxy had that were tools to help me get there. And now I have those. And so I have to be a little bit humble and remember that sometimes we go on journeys that our parents didn't predict or want. Uh, that doesn't mean that we're not with Christ. And it doesn't mean that it's not a path that leads back to exactly where our parents would want us to be in the first place. So I think, you know, we need to have a little faith. We need to trust in our prayers and in our God's ability to answer our prayers, in his desire to answer our prayers, in his love for us. He loves your children. He loves you. He wants you to have a desire for him. So when you ask him to give you that desire, he will, because he wants you to have it, right? He'll give you things that are for your salvation. So I feel like I've just said too much. I feel like I'm talking too much and I can't see the questions. So I'm thinking that what we'll do is we'll just break for now or we'll finish up here. And then perhaps um, I'll be able to take some of the questions next week when I'm back next Sunday. Thank you so much for having me. You, I, you know, I really enjoy this. It's really nice. I look forward to last week. I know some people messaged me on Facebook afterwards and uh, I really enjoyed that. I really like interacting and hearing what you're thinking. So please feel free to do that. Um, you can search my name on Facebook and send me a message. I would love that. Uh, let's close with a prayer, just a short one. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen. Holy Lord, we thank you for this time together. We thank you for your presence in our midst. We ask that you protect us and keep us and help us to carry your spirit within us as we go into the world. Through the prayers of your all holy mother and all the saints, amen. So thank you. Sorry about the questions, but uh, I'll see you next week. <laughs>